Hi, my name is Thomas Yeager. I'm the creator of creatinggreatsoftware.com, where I teach about building, designing, and architecting great software. This is our fourth and last installment of the little mini-series named Microservices. In the fourth installment, uh, I will be talking about um, event-driven microservices. Uh, this is very critical, especially as your system gets larger and larger over time. So uh, let's dive right in. Next, we'll talk about event-driven microservices. Um, so how do you, if you don't call them directly, so how, how do you get information that you don't have access to? Remember, a microservice is doing one thing really well, and it shields everybody else from accessing this information because it's responsible to do this one thing really well. However, the more microservices you have and you compose uh, a larger system with multiple microservices, you, need, you still need access to this information, right? And so how do you do that? Uh, and this, this is important, especially when you go into the cloud, um, just because of the nature of the cloud. So the way you do this is um, that you can think of a microservice is listening to interesting business domain events. Um, and I'll go to an example here. Say um, that the, the billing microservice needs to know when a tenant has paid the rent. And so I can imagine, say, um, a tenant maybe goes to an online website for a property management company, or they might even go physically to the tenant, to the property management company, giving them a physical check. I don't know if that still happens nowadays, but that's, that's unlikely. But if they do, they want to be able to take different forms of payments, um, different forms of uh, or payment tenders, so to speak, payment tenders to pay the rent. It could be an automated process through ACH, debit uh, transactions. It could be with a credit card, debit card. So different ways of for tenants to pay their rent. But in this case, the property management uh, microservice just handles that process, that, work, that, that use case of a tenant eventually has paid the rent. And so when, when the property management microservice eventually gets done in this use case scenario that it will trigger a, an interesting event that has already happened in the past. And this is tenant paid rent. This is intentionally meant in past tense because, uh, for example, the billing service here cannot change the fact that the tenant has already paid the rent on the property management system. Remember, from the architecture of what we, what we learned earlier in domain-driven design, especially with a bounded context, that a microservice, you can, you can consider that as a bounded context, a physical bounded context, not just logical, but a microservice with its core domain has a physical bounded context. And so in that context, the tenant has paid. So a tenant paid the rent, right? But the microservice over here, the property management microservice, does not know, does not need to know who else needs to know. It just needs to know or publish this domain event somewhere. It has to publish it within the system, within the cloud provider in this case. So the the event tenant paid rent will be published inside the cloud, right? And so as long as that domain event is being exposed or published some, somehow, and we go into that a little bit later, that anybody else who's interested in that can listen to this interesting domain event. And in this case, we have one microservice, the billing microservice, listening for this event. And so when that happens, it can subscribe to certain types of business events. Now keep in mind, this is not necessarily very technical events. These are simply described in ubiquitous language in domain-driven design that this fact has already happened, but somebody needs to process this event when this happens. So you can have one or many listening to this one event, interesting business event. In that case, the billing microservice will consume or subscribe to this kind of event. And so when that happens, the microservice consumes this interesting event and does its own thing. So within the context of the billing, the, the, uh, the bounded context of the billing microservice, it will process this fact that tenant has already paid the rent. So it needs information like probably, I'm guessing, 
uh, things like some kind of tenant identifier that would work, uh, maybe a social security number, maybe uh, an account number, some kind of identifier that can be shared across these different bounded contexts. And we go into a lot more detail about identifications and aggregates and how to do all this when we actually implement this in some of my other courses that I have. But just keep that in mind so that the billing microservice gets this domain event. This domain event carries some attributes like a tenant name, maybe a tenant identifier, the amount that was paid, which property or which residence, uh, maybe it was an apartment or some kind of identifier, what happened here, right? So it consumes this event or processes it, meaning it might generate a receipt, right? And so once it's done processing this event, it generates a receipt. And so when it creates the receipt, that receipt can be accessed maybe through another mechanisms and I'll go to that in another section. But just keep in mind that the microservice here will generate another domain event, receipt created. And so this can go on and on and on, right? Because you can have services creating multiple domain events and they can listen to these things. The important part is that these things have already happened. It's in the past. Nobody can change this stuff, this fact that this domain event has happened. And so receipt is created and some other service or somebody else can now consume this uh, receipt and maybe send an email, maybe generate a PDF, maybe another microservice creates all these things, these artifacts. And so as you can see, Mm, these two microservices do not communicate directly. Their only publishing has already happened in their domain because they're the controller of their domain, right? So keep this in mind. That is the key. And with this, you can create many dozens, hundreds, or thousands of uh, microservices if you wanted to. Absolutely. Um, there's other things you need to consider about eventual consistencies, things like they're not immediately available, there's a slight delay. But when you have arguments about, um, well, I need to know right away. So that already is uh, subjective because the the concept of right away or real time, there's, there's no such thing as real time, really. There's always gonna be a delay, right? And so you can easily talk to the domain or experts to, the, to on the business side saying, okay, how soon do you really need to know or when do you need this receipt delivered to the tenant, right? And so it could be a minute later, 30 seconds later, or six hours later, or the next day. Those are the things you can talk to with your domain experts and business side. In general, there's always a delay. Nobody works in real time, really. There's always a delay in processing things on a business side. And so uh, the, the fact that you have slightly delayed events happening until they're seen or delivered to another party in the system, it works perfectly fine. So, all right, so this was a, a short introduction into microservices and how they communicate really. Uh, I hope this was very interesting to you and let's move on to the next lecture.